day. This is Dr. Conrad Miller giving you your Fukushima update for March 2014, three years after the Fukushima disaster, the earthquake, the tsunami, the explosions, the meltdowns, the cover-up, and now the continued leaking of 400 tons of radioactive water into the Pacific Ocean every day to diffuse all around that ocean and bioaccumulate and so on. And it still hasn't stopped. It's still at the same rate that it was in the beginning, after the meltdowns occurred. Now on the site, according to Arnie Gunderson from the teleconference that was given by the Nuclear Information Resource Service on March 6th, Arnie Gunderson, the nuclear engineer, tells us that there are hundreds and hundreds of tanks on the site to collect the polluted groundwater, the radioactive groundwater that's coming from the buildings in the basement of those three reactors, one, two, three, and on the site, and the groundwater that's coming up that's getting contaminated and then leaking into the ocean. He also noted that TEPCO said that the groundwater in the wells on the plant is rising and falling with the tide, which means there's no barriers between the groundwater and the ocean. We know that the cores are there in reactors one through three, but we can't find them. But they're fragmenting, and all the radioisotopes that come from fissioning uranium to boil water to make steam to turn a turbine to create electricity, that's nuclear power, they are all leaking into the groundwater, all these different radioisotopes that are radioactive for hundreds and thousands and millions of years. And he says that a huge radioactive lake is forming underneath the plant. And cesium and strontium-90 are in enormous amounts in that water. Uh, and strontium-90, for example, is the one that causes... The body takes it in as calcium, it gets into your bone, and by the bone marrow, causes leukemia and bone cancer, strontium-90. Now, fuel pool 4 is about 100 feet up in the air. That reactor was destroyed, number four. But the fuel pool is still sitting there with water in it, and it has all these fuel assemblies in it that have to be disassembled and taken out. And he says it'll take about a year and a half to do that, but the, the racks that hold the fuel assemblies are all squeezed and cracked. So they have to pull out the easy ones first and then try to pull the other ones out. But if you pull too hard on ones that are stuck, then the Krypton 85 gas gets out, and that breaks down into other radioactive radioactive granddaughter products and daughter products that can cause cancer and the other things that radioisotopes can do. Now, he says 99% of the radioactivity actually, though, is in the reactors 1 through 3, which they're trying to decommission with robotics. It'll actually take, he says, 50 years, maybe 100, if they can do it. Um, it's going to cost about $15 billion, he, he states, to clean up each of those reactors. And with four reactors that actually have to be cleaned up, it's going to cost maybe $60, $70 billion. That's just to clean up that part of the plant. Basically, they're whitewashing the off-site exposures. They're ignoring the krypton and xenon releases, which were vast. Fukushima released three times the amount of radioactivity that Chernobyl released because there were three reactors that melted down and the fourth reactor that got destroyed and Chernobyl really only had one reactor that exploded. It had a steam explosion and a 10-day graphite fire. Now in the area around Fukushima there's already a dramatic increase in thyroid cancer which comes from the iodine. It's one of the radioisotopes. Then there are the hot particles, which they're detecting 300 miles away from the plant. Now, Tokyo is only 150 miles away, so you know the hot particles are going to be found in Tokyo. And this would include things like plutonium, which has a half-life of 24,000 years and causes lung cancer. So if these hot particles drift along, float in the air, and get into your lung, you're going to get lung cancer. It may not happen immediately. It usually takes 20, 30 years. Anyway, no one is tracking these hot particles, according to Mr. Gunderson. But people are using their vacuum cleaner bags and sending them in to be tested 
for the hot particles. And the hot particles, again, are being found as far as 300 miles away. And again, these hot particles can, are like your, the vacuum cleaner bags are like your lungs. So if the hot particles are in the vacuum cleaner bags, they can be in your lungs and you can get cancer. This gross distortion of the health statistics and everything is exacerbated by something called the Japanese Secrets Act, which was passed in December by the Japanese government. And if you say something like that the site at Fukushima has been inf infiltrated by organized crime, there's horrific signs of ecological disaster in the Pacific already, and human health impacts in the United States, you can go to jail for 10 years in Japan because it's punishable by, the, punishable by the Japanese Secrets Act. And also under this act, the Japanese government can ban or arrest all independent media, media people under any conditions in Fukushima. And uh, we do know that a, a professor was detained for 20 days before the act was passed without trial for speaking out against the open-air incineration of radioactive waste from Fukushima. Now, Arnie s states that he thinks there will be 100,000 to a million cancers produced from this accident, although the International Atomic Energy Association, IAEA, they say ah, oh, only be 100. And the GE company, General Electric, they built the plants in the 60s, and they were trying to cut costs. So this was not an act of God. This was an act of greed, as Mr. Gunderson says, because of the way things were constructed. The new Prime Minister, Abe, and the IAEA are trying to start the plants up that have been closed down. And um, there's about 54 plants in Japan. Two or three are up in Ohio. The rest have been closed, and the Japanese people don't want them open. According to Mr. Gunderson, it's going to cost about, altogether about a hundred, uh, half a trillion dollars to clean up everything in Japan. But they're not telling the Japanese people that. TEPCO, the electrical company in Japan, that is trying to deal with this crisis at Fukushima, is not doing very well. And Mr. Gunnarsson suggests that they should be relieved of trying to take care of it with perhaps an American or another type of contractor to do the cleanup and send it in a different direction with an open, transparent process of scientists and citizens dealing with the problem. A child, you should know, is 10 times more radiosensitive than an adult. And girls are 10 to 20 times more sensitive than adults uh, in exposure to radioactivity. Two REMS is not an acceptable dose. But that's what they're saying. It's okay if you live in Fukushima now. You can accept that. Even though two REMS is, a two th is 2,000 millirems. Background radiation is 200 millirems. So that's 20 times the normal amount, 10 times rather, the normal amount of radioactivity you have to accept according to the people in Japan right now in Fukushima. So for every 20 people, every 20 kids rather, who go back to the contaminated areas, one child will develop cancer by age 20. One out of 20. He says turn off the water so more water doesn't come into the plant because they're using water to cool down the reactors in one through three. But then it's leaking out through the basement. There's a hole in the bottom. So then that's more groundwater, more contaminated ground, groundwater that's going to go out into the ocean. Uh, people have said maybe we can inject concrete around the plant and seal it off. Arnie says maybe. He's not sure about that. Then they talk about this ice wall, which sounds ridiculous. They won't even start it for two years. How are they going to keep it cold? How are they going to dig it? Crazy. Um, now we go to Eileen Miyoko Smith. She reported in from Kyoto, Japan. She's with Green Action of Japan. And she thinks that there's a contest going on for the contracts. And we need international bidding and discussion of what can be done there. 
she notes that even before the accident, there were 400 tons of groundwater passing under the plant every day. So she states 15,000 were killed by the tsunami. 78% of those people who were killed were in this band of area that really was susceptible to tsunamis. But civil engin engineers said, it's okay, you can build there, you can live there. So 135,000 people have been evacuated from the Fukushima area, but two-thirds still live in the prefecture. Acceptable radiation, as I said, was up to two rems, or 20 millisieverts per year, which is, again, 10 times the background radiation. They're saying to the people, we'll decontaminate the areas. We won't evacuate you and your kids. So they have piles and piles of contaminated earth along the road. The kids can't go outside and play. She thinks they all should be evacuated, which I agree with. But they're trying to bring the people back. So they evacuated 12 areas, and now they want to try to repopulate six of the 12. Uh, they'll give you $9,000 if you come back to fix up and do what you can with your land and your house, etc. There's a victim's relief law that was passed in Japan, unanimously in the Diet, but the implementation is not being done. All evacuations be as, as, all evacuants are supposed to be assisted. So what they're trying to do is get local people to do the educating, educating of the people about it's okay to be exposed to 20 millisieverts or 2,000 milligrams every year. So she's saying, are you telling us to grin and bear it, that we shouldn't be afraid of radiation? She said they're doing a terrible health study that's very limited. They're checking thyroids, but they're not checking other organs and maladies and cancers. So there's no proper controls, and the study is designed not to find anything, is what she says. I, Eileen Mayoko Smith. Um, now, the Japanese Diet Commission was investigating the plant, and they uh, spent a lot of time there. They spent 57 hours on studying Fukushima and 457 hours studying how to restart all the other reactors. So she says that we need an opening up for study of the area to the international community. Ms. Miyoko Smith also states that the government of Japan is using models of earthquakes instead of actual data to see if the 54 plants that exist in Japan right now could withstand earthquakes, which they probably wouldn't, she said, if they used the real data. She also notes that when the study was done by the Japanese Diet Commission that people were not named, although they said it was a man-made and not a natural disaster. Diane Dorigo from NIRS talked about radiation and monitoring and states that avoid Avoidance or prevention of exposure, of course, is the best way to deal with everything. But meanwhile, we need reporting, we need calculation of doses, risks, and we're layered in between these things with all the people that say, don't worry, don't worry, nothing's going to happen, don't worry, everything's fine. Because radioisotopes don't stay isolated, they mix in with everything else. Cesium acts like uh, potassium, and the body takes it up and it gets into your heart and it goes into your kidneys and affects these organs, for example, in a bad way. Uh, so she says that would violate the, the law of entropy. So we need constant monitoring, but the government in Japan is relying on the generators of radiation to provide the information, because they have the resources to do this. But Mr. Rigo says that the members of the public have to do the monitoring, as what happened in Pennsylvania at Three Mile Island. There are different detectors with different sensitivities, so they have to all be correlated together. But NIRS has a list of links and places that are doing monitoring, including especially public monitoring, and it's split into the United States group 
and the international group, and the international group includes Japan. Woods Hole up in Massachusetts is also monitoring as one example. They're monitoring different radionuclides in the water, and they're also monitoring fish that feed on the bottom of the sediment and fish that swim across the Pacific like tuna, like the tuna that we found off San Diego that had cesium in it from Fukushima, in them from Fukushima. The University of California Berkeley is monitoring and they're finding spikes in milk and grass and other foods. Cesium-134, again that's a two-year half-life, so that did not come from the atomic bombs, that came from Fukushima. The EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States, is monitoring. The unfortunate thing is they are monitoring milk, water, air, precipitation for specific radionuclides. The only thing is you don't get the results for two months. So if you're eating that food today, you won't know. So it's not very useful. And also there are monitors they're not using, and during the event they didn't turn some detectors on from March 11, 2011 when it occurred and thereafter shortly. And now the EPA is giving bad advice to Japan for the risk range. So the radiation is spreading and we don't really know exactly how it's spreading, but we know it's getting into the food and the water and the air. Uh, some people advise us that the peaking will be in 2016 in the water, but we know it's, it by accumulates up the food chain in the milk, the fish, the vegetables, the animals, the kelp. So with the leaking of 400 tons of that radioactive water every day into the Pacific Ocean, this number is not going to peak in 2016 unless we stop it, which doesn't look very likely. So we're like frogs in hot water, she says. And the radiation counts keep getting higher and higher as the radioactive water continues to be released. Mr. Rigo recommends action and is specifically preventing the Environmental Protection Agency from raising the allowable or safe radioactive exposure levels higher and higher and not to give the same advice as they seem to be doing to the Japanese either. And another organization, FAN, FFAN, is calling for reducing allowing cesium contamination in food because in the United States we allow 1200 becquerels per kilogram and Germany is calling for only 5 becquerels per kilogram and we know that if you take in 10 becquerels per kilogram per day and you're a child you'll be you'll have toxic cardiac, cardiac levels in three years if that happens to you for example with kids in Chernobyl so and the fish for example in Japan that are offshore from Fukushima most of them are in the counts of about a thousand becquerels per kilogram. So there in Japan the level you can eat is only a hundred becquerels per kilogram but in the United States it's 1200 so we could possibly eat those fish from Japan if they wanted to send it to us. So she says we should support continued evacuation of people out of the contaminated areas especially the kids of course and they shouldn't be allowed to, or induced to come back into Fukushima and also to stop the incineration of radioactive materials rubble, waste in Japan, which they're doing. Um, just on this, uh, Miss Miyoko Smith was saying that people were speaking up in Japan about this incinerating of the wastes, including that professor who was, in, who was, who was put in Japan for 20 days, 20 days. Some people can stop the burning, and some places can't get that done. So what they're doing is they're spreading around the waste to create a culture to get the waste treated as industrial waste because if they dilute it then it's a little bit less but you still when you burn or incinerate radioactivity it doesn't destroy it it just spreads it around so she thinks it's also leading to a, a pathway for the future reactors that have to be broken down to be commissioned and then treated like industrial waste like that too and it's a way of dispersing radioactivity into safe areas by changing the exposure levels that are safe, the 20 millisieverts, which is 20, 10 times higher than the background radiation. 
they have blue bags for radioactive waste, that he, and the waste is put in these blue bags, and they're next to your house, and they're next to the school, and in the street, and there's nowhere to go, no place to put it, and they're pitting citizen against citizen in Japan. She says that the media reporting, Miss Miyoko Smith, uh, the media reporting the debate about what's going on is going in the wrong direction. Summing up, Mr. Gunderson states that Fukushima is the worst industrial accident in the history of the world. He praises the heroes at Fukushima who helped prevent this disaster from being even worse because if this had happened 2 o'clock in the morning instead of 2 o'clock in the afternoon when there were a thousand people there, when there were only a hundred at night, it would have been a lot worse. Uh, he also states that 80% of the airborne radioactivity went out to sea at Fukushima. And then there were those sailors at, on the USS Ronald Reagan, which deserves another update. And if the wind was blowing the other way, Tokyo would have been affected down south, 150 miles away, and it would have had to be evacuated, and eventually the country would have been cut in half, and Tokyo would have been contaminated forever, as... Fukushima really is. It really should be a forbidden zone. So this is the end of the update for today. This is Dr. Conrad Miller. 400 tons of radioactive water are going out into the ocean every day, into the Pacific Ocean every day, and by accumulating in the kelp and the fish and all the animals and plants in the ocean. And if you're around the Pacific Ocean, it's coming to you. And they found an edge of the edge of the radioactivity in Alaska at this point so far. Heading for California, if it's not there already. And a report, Dr. Conrad Miller. Thank you very much.